Well, welcome everyone um, to this uh, um, LHA um, panel on aspects of Acadiana. Can everyone hear me? Good, okay. Um, and so uh, this panel has two participants uh, today. One uh, has pulled out and I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody and um, introduce our first speaker. Uh, Abigail Scott of the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Um, and her talk today is on Bouquet et Lapin en ouvert l'ouest. Abby? Okay. Um, I guess that's my uh, sign to start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm presenting uh, Bouquet et Lapin en ouvert l'ouest. Okay. One day, compère Lapin et compère Bouquet were going on a journey together. Compère Lapin often took Buki with them to make fun of him and to hear all the news which Buki knew. The opening sentences to Alsace Fortier, The Elephant and the Whale, established a relationship between his paper's titular characters. Compère Lapin, under the guise of friendship, totes Compère Buki along on a trip for its own benefit. Despite Buki receiving the semblance of vacation, Lapin intends to mock the larger animal. Buki, Wolofer Hyena, represented the battle represented the black population in both Louisiana and Texas. Buki is often the fool in these stories, but he is uneducated and gullible. Lapin, French for rabbit, represented the white planter who duped Buki much to his dismay. At the peak of the slave trade, Buki and Lapin had a mutually dependent relationship, even though we know today that it was not dependent. Um, the combination of Buki or uh, blacks and Lapin, the white Creoles, confused Anglo-American settlers. The corresponding etymology inspired me to view each group as physical actors in the borderland. The antebellum period, Lapin enslaved Buki, then relied on coerced labor for money, monetary gains. Whenever Buki liberated itself, a different compère Lapin captured it and administered punishment. In extending this illusion, Mexican abolition raised the prices for enslaved labor in Texas. These American quote unquote abolitionists aided self-liberated Blacks in their flight to Texas. However, once in Texas, these quote unquote abolitionists enslaved their traveling companions and sold them to Texas planters. Once again, Compère Lapin subjected Compère Bouquet to pain and death. I adapted this paper from the second chapter of my master's thesis. While I focused on Natchitoches and Nacogdoches as interconnected cities, I am in a section about Acadiana so I've tried to add more information pertaining to this region. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic limited my researching capabilities, so I cannot portray a larger painting of Acadiana during this transitory period of Western movement. Um, so this period is um, 1800 to 1830. I also want to say that this paper does not intend to answer every question about <laughs> Acadiana and the borderlands, but instead, raise this question of how we should view um, Acadiana. Um, in my thesis, I emphasized Dr. John Sibley of Natchitoches and his efforts with the Caddo, Cushada, Tavoya, Wichita, and other indigenous nations. When I presented my thesis this past August, I mentioned a potential topic in moving my focus farther south, but to do so, I must also focus my attention to local nations, such as the Takapa Ishak and Opelousas, who I connect back to Nacogdoches, Texas. I have yet to pursue such research, so I must apologize <laughs> for my false advertisement in this panel. <laughs> Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches relied on American goods to survive in the frontier town. The geospatial distance between Mexico City and the Texan towns enabled American expansion west of the Sabine River. Nacogdoches attracted Americans due to its proximity to Nacogdoches and in turn, the Sabine River. I use what I call the quote unquote Sabine Strip or the hundred miles between the two towns as my geographic anchor. The Sabine River created a physical boundary separating freedom, the United States from despotism, um, which is Mexico. This is of course, American views of freedom and uh, anarchy. This is, uh, while the Sabine Strip remained relatively uninhabited, Nacogdoches, American citizens promoted illegal trade with the United States as a means for survival. Mexican officials like Manuel Mier Itaran 
rarely regarded American settlements on the borderlands. Mexico had promoted American colonization in Texas through its impresario system. During the 1830s, Mexico extended its enforcement on these colonies. Once Americans vocalized their grievances about Amer uh, Mexican authority, they cited the 1824 legislation as an article as Article 7 granted rights for unregulated foreign colonization until 1840. Mexican politicians foresaw potential complications in the immigration quotas as the nation reserved the right to prohibit settlement. To maintain a semblance of Mexican authority, the same law prevented settlements es establishment within 20 leagues of borders. In Eastern Texas, that zone straddled the Sabine River as an attempt to prevent American influence into the region. This obviously failed. On an 1830 map, Stephen F. Austin drew an east-west road leading from San Antonio de Bexar to Nacogdoches and then to Natchitoches. Again, in 1837, Austin surveyed eastern Texas with its adjoining states. The roads led east to Natchitoches, north to a Cherokee village, southwest towards San Antonio de Bexar, and south to Galveston Bay. Both maps cited the eastern boundary accorded to Manuel Mier y Taran's observations during his exploration of eastern Texas. And in effect, Nacogdoches acted as the nexus for eastern Texas. Mexico organized a military expedition to the Sabine River. In East Texas, its proximity to Louisiana allowed flights and refuge from Mexican officials. Nacogdoches served a similar role for Natchitoches as eastward travelers used the city as a final market before commencing their journey to the last leg into the United States. Outside of Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches in 1826, impresario Hayden Edwards was disgruntled with Mexican government governance. Americans viewed Mexico as an incompetent democracy and their, um, and their regulations against enslavement of Africans further annoyed American settlers. Manuel Mier y Taran, leader of this expedition, already had a negative opinion towards the United States and effectively US-Mexican diplomatic relations deteriorated. Mexico intentionally intended for an impresario system to serve as a buffer between Mexican ranches and Native Americans in the Northern borderland and urban Natchitoches to shift our view eastward to compare what we had seen in Nacogdoches. In urban Natchitoches, a French population flourished to the west of the town in modern day Robline, Los Adeas situated itself as a Hispanic cultural pocket in the borderland. Los Adeas was a Spanish fort established to prevent French encroachment into Spanish territory, but the neutral ground agreement of 1806 demilitarized the environment which, prom with, which prompted Mexican authorities to abandon Los Adeas as a viable habitation. Due south of Natchitoches on the Red River, Alexandra was a quote unquote, American only village. Laws and debris had blocked the river just north of the town and travelers had to forego their boats in favor of horses and wagons to reach Natchitoches. This inconvenience influenced American settlement in Alexandria. Since the rapids halted commerce on the Red River's banks, merchants requested help to transport their goods. And thus, Alexandria detracted jobs from Natchitoches and both frontier towns adopted adopted characteristics of a port town, such as New Orleans. These little ethnic conclaves implied a potential isolation from, foreigner, from foreigners, but the borderland required inter-ethnic interactions. Census records indicate the region's basic ethnic composition, but the land patterns show interactions between different groups. Sibley, uh, aforementioned uh, leader in Natchitoches, he was the chief of, not chief, the head of the Indian factory until its disbandment uh, in later 1800. Um, Sibley had bought land from Francophones living in Natchitoches. Some, patent, some patents list Sibley's, Sibley's names next to a Mercier and a Gagne. A shrewd businessman, Sibley used the intercultural interactions of his own entrepreneurial endeavors. Ambrose Lecomte and Placide Boisier purchased roughly 400 acres with of land with a Samuel M. Hyams, who was an Anglo man. According to census records, Hyams was an Anglo immigrant from South Carolina, and he profited from Louisiana's, Louisiana's burgeoning cotton industry. From government records and plat records, the Prudhomme and other Creole families already owned arpits along the Red River. 
only prominent Americans such as Dr. John Sibley, uh, John C. Carr, and N.C. Bloodworth owned waterfront property. The U.S. government, government had approved Spanish and, land, Spanish and French land grants. And in 1816, once the United States government started to approve these land plans, Emmanuel Proutot maintained his water access property. He then, he then purchased his neighbor's adjoining land, thus augmenting his over, overall farming, farming property. During his trip in the United States, Theodore Pavey, um, a Frenchman who was visiting his family who were also Paveys living in Natchitoches, a prominent family, um, Pavey described Louisiana Creoles as hedonistic characters diagnosed with their own ceaseless dancing. Creole joy persevered through devastating floods and epidemics. If anything, the Creoles lacked depression, the press long-winded monologues about their economic loss. Theodore mused on enslaved death as Creoles paused their celebrations for, quote, sad, silent reflections on greater anguish between men or money, unquote. The Red River's alluvial land produced abundant cotton crops. And once among his kindred souls, Theodore Pavey praised Louisiana's agricultural vitality. A hundred feet away from his window at night, the Red River flowed with, quote, vast fields extending on both sides, planting cotton, high stalks of corn, gracious parasols of lilas mixed with tufts of castor oil plants, unquote. Natchitoches' thriving cotton industry enticed American entry into the market. Natchitoches, however, had the sizable European population who owned the best land. On top of that, Natchitoches, Natchitoches had a free large people of color population who contributed equally to American fears as their neighbors were neither white nor Anglophone. The Cane River Creoles of color thrived at Isle de Breville, located just south of Natchitoches. These free people of color employed the same plantation system and they used enslaved black labor to tend to their cotton, cr cotton crops. Their skin tone alone pushed American settlers away as these Creoles had more wealth and power than their newly arrived neighbors. One member of this family is Louis Metoyer, Louis Metoyer was a son of Marie-Thérèse Concon, an enslaved woman who worked under Natchitoches founder Louis Jericho de Saint-Denis. After his death, widow Saint-Denis granted Concon's manumission. She inherited land south of Natchitoches, which became the haven for Creoles of color. Louis Metoyer founded Yucca Plantation, now named Melrose, where the Isle Braville community flourished. White men dined frequently at the Métoyer abode, yet white women could not attend these soirees. The Métoyer family had money, but they also had black blood. Their economic status could not trump their racial status. Outside of the Métoyer family, Ambrose de Comte had one of the more successful plantations in the region. His last name, Le Comte, highlights his French heritage, thus establishing the old French aristocracy living in Natchitoches prior to the Louisiana Purchase. Since Le Comte, Métoyer, Purum, and other French families dominated Natchitoches land records, Americans sought land grants elsewhere. Luckily for them, the empresario system in Mexico had granted them permission for American colonies in Texas. Even though Louisianians cultivated the major river, rivers and lands surrounding the Sabine River, it, the Sabine River remained sparsely populated. Since the Creoles of color dominated Natchitoches' agricultural section, new American settlers sought fresh, unsettled land in eastern Texas. In 1829, Theodore Pavey embarked to Nacogdoches from Natchitoches with his uncle, Charles Pavey. In his writings, Les Souvenirs Atlantiques, um, Pavey mused how more vultures than chickens live in the Sabine Strip. Therefore, he symbolized death as a vulture which stripped the corpses clean of their flesh. The skeletal remains served as morbid reminders of the conquest bloodshed. The borderland was equally forgiving and unforgiving. Louisiana's sublime landscape disguised the Sabine Strip's destructive force. Theodore visited Louisiana during a yellow fever epidemic. Elsewhere, summer was a time of birth and life. In Louisiana, winter was the time for la vie, and decadent white Creoles pursued leisurely activities of hunting and other pleasures. Louisiana was an American haze, 
while Texas was in American Elysian fields. Once Mexico decided to abandon the lands east of Nacogdoches due to the 1806 Neutral Land Agreement, the Sabine Strip became a haven for American squatters. However, historian Juan Haggard pointed out the lack of sources about outlaws within the region. If anything, the Sabine Strip was a region where people could explore their identities. The government's lack of intervention cultivated a melange of cultures. Upon approaching the Sabine River, Theodore Pavey noticed a societal inversion. Mexicans and Americans dressed in Native American fashions. They, quote, saluted at, as if they were Spanish or godly accepted a swallow of grog if they were descendants of Englishmen, unquote. In these imperial margins, groups coexisted, yet the blurred lines kindled paranoia, paranoia toward the unknown. To identify the unknown and potential problems, the empire reached its tendrils into the borderland. And American settlers received legal status to, to live within Mexican Texas. And a letter addressed to his brother, Theodor Pavey, justified his safety in the borderlands. He packed carabines and other and a large hunting knife from for the trek from Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches. Outside of cannibal, cannibal <laughs> Native Americans, there were no, there was no dangers. According to this, according to his musings, Nacogdoches existed as a civilization within dispersed Native American groups, and these habits of nomadic life extended into the same assimilationist American institutions. Due to indigenous expulsion from the United States, Comancheria and other Texan natives nations needed to accommodate this new population influx. Mexico's independence also strained the new country's resources. Few soldiers protected the interior provinces and powerful indigenous nations like the Comanche Empire roamed in and around Texas. Persistent violence frightened Mexicans from, so from settling in the northern provinces, yet Mexico needed a buffer to prevent Comanches from moving southward. In response, Mexico invited these Americans to settle in Texas, with many settling around Nacogdoches. Due to the spatial geography, Nacogdoches and Nacogdoches were closer in proximity compared to Nacogdoches and other Mexican towns. In Nacogdoches, American settlers grew discontent with their governments. Benjamin Edwards, a Nacogdoches impresario, rebelled against the Mexican government. Subsequently, Mexico increased its military presence in the borderland. General Manuel Mir y Tehran traveled to Nacogdoches where he noted American complaints. Tehran planned to also map the Sabine River as a hard border between Mexico and the United States. However, Tehran failed in his expedition. Americans grew outraged with the lack of governmental representation and the settlers viewed themselves as American citizens, not Mexican citizens. The United States had to prove itself as a val valuable ally through Nacogdoches aid and economic policies. Americans were disgruntled with Mexico's lack of interest, yet they also thrived thanks to their own rogue colonialism. The United States land acquisitions relied on pervasive genocide against indigenous nations. In Florida, Andrew Jackson terrorized Seminoles and his presidency fal of Palestine. <laughs> his president created a series of indigenous death marches. Nations such as the Cushata, Cherokee, and Alabama had settled in Western territories like Louisiana. However, American con conquests forced these communities to continue their trek westward. The Mexican government offered a repose to the weary travelers and were refugees in Texas. And indigenous towns served as a buffer against American colonists and their exploits. Like a Sisyphean fallacy, Native Americans lived in a cyclical system of forced migration, settlement, violence, and a series of repetitions. In Texas, American colonists imported slavery, and the system fractured relations between Mexico and their impresarios. Cram the aggression stuck into attacks against Mexicans, Native Americans, or American colonists as the borderlands cultivated the tensions for violent actions. In 1838, Vincent Cordova, an East Texas judge, gathered disgruntled Mexicans and Native Americans to overthrow the Anglo-American system in Nacogdoches. Each group responded to each other's actions, but ultimately Mexican reactions to American conflicts exploded in the Texas War for Independence.
the war zone promulgated colonial flight in Louisiana, and while Natchitoches prospered from its location on the fringes of the borderland in Louisiana, these same elements detracted attention from Natchitoches. The borderland dissipated in Texas, and Natchitoches eventually lost its position as a bastion for civilization before entering a new frontier. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Um, did anyone have any questions that they wanted to put in the chat? Anyone for Abby? Questions about um, Nacogdoches and Nacogdoches? <laughs> Well, if no one has any um, questions, I um, I wanted to ask a, a, a question of Abby um, that is maybe taking it in a different direction than maybe your research is going. Um, but as you know, Abby, I'm a French professor. And so I am wondering it, um, if you could speak a little bit to maybe the linguistic communities that are involved in um, your paper, like uh, what were they, um, I'm assuming that the um, the metoyer were uh, francophone, but maybe my assumption is mm -hmm. wrong here. Can you speak a little bit to um, the linguistics, uh, the linguistic situation, and how you might theorize that that uh, changed how it contributed to some of these disputes and difficulties? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I. I actually applied to the University of Kansas for a PhD and I intend to pursue this topic further. Um, but yes, the Métoyers did speak French. Um, and I found the fact that we have this French borderland with um, like Mexican and other um, Spanish speakers. It's something kind of unseen elsewhere in the United States, especially in borderland histories. And I wanted to pursue this topic to kind of explore that dichotomy. Um, as I, I mentioned that I wish I could have moved south. Um, when I first proposed this topic for this panel, I, I for some reason, I thought Natchitoches and Opelousas were a lot closer than they really are. Um, and that was just me just being goofy and not looking at a map and realizing that, wait, these are two separate places um, with two totally radically different histories. Um, now, I feel that if anything, the fact that there was such a large French population in Natchitoches, it led to almost some conflict. So I didn't find actual like written diaries speaking about it, but um, the John Sibley that I've mentioned before, he was originally from um, Massachusetts, then he moved to North Carolina, then eventually to Louisiana. He actually ran for um, the Louisiana Senate multiple times in the House of Representatives. And I remember when I was doing my research, I made notes where it was him and he would go back and forth with like a prudhomme and then a pavy. Like they would like one um, legal, uh, like calendar year it would be Sibley, the next year would suddenly be somebody with a French last name, then would be back to Sibley or Sibley would go somewhere else. So I feel like if anything, it might have like created more of a tension because it's almost as if, yes, they lived next to each other because they were buying land and, you know, they were neighbors, but for the like records of, for like the Senate and stuff, for them to be going back and forth so much, it almost seems as if there was also like a friendly rival rivalry that developed between the families. Mm -hmm. And that would have been um, at least partially mm -hmm. uh, linguistic as well as uh, mm -hmm. a cultural. I mean, the language doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's, it's cultural as well. Um, what about, uh, you know, over in Texas, do you see some mm -hmm. of the same linguistic issues cropping up there yeah so in texas it's more um issues with the spanish speakers mm -hmm. um but a lot of the um, indigenous nations because sibley was in charge of the indian factory in natchitoches a lot of their actual like tour guides if you could say were actually people who were um 
like indigenous themselves. Now also to bring in like another aspect, a lot of like enslaved Africans were also uh, guides and who spoke multiple languages. Um, I also remember looking in Nacogdoches' records, there's actually a lot of people with French last names who moved from Natchitoches to Nacogdoches. And it's it, it can be surmised that perhaps they also brought the French language, but they were a much smaller percentage compared to all the Americans that were moving into that town at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, so if anyone has any questions that come up for Abby, please put them in the chat and we will probably have enough time at the end to take some more questions. Um, so if you'd like to be thinking about that. Um, we'll go on to our second speaker, uh, Jacob Gotro um, from Louisiana State University. And his um, talk for us today is John Lynch, father of the flyway botanist, uh, sorry, biologist, a professional naturalist and dedicated conservationist. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you. Um, the first thing I need to do is share my screen. And then could you just give me a thumbs up if you can see the PowerPoint on the screen? Okay, great, great. In 1937, biologist John Lynch was stationed along the wetlands of Southern Louisiana as a member of the Bureau of Biological Survey or the BBS. His mission was to study the attempts to manage the marsh, observe the changing environment, and most importantly, to analyze the migratory wildlife that used the location as a winter home. This last factor proved to define Lynch for the rest of his life and give him his moniker, the father of the flyway biologist. However, the conservation model that Lynch and others promoted was inherently alienating to the public. It both demonized local sportsmen as responsible for the death of target species, arguably true, and advocated for a solution that established the only answer for endangered species as nature reserves cut off from public use. Such results initiated a gap between conservationist-minded individuals and the nascent environmentalist movement of the 1950s, as the former favored a more hands-on approach. However, both saw privatized nature as the only solution to an ecological crisis. In South Louisiana, this transformation took a sinister turn as more and more of the public commons was privatized by both private and public interests over the 20th century. To tell the full story, I first recount the influence of European markets on wildlife and the expansion of the commercial market for feathers. This leads to the history of ornithological societies in the 19th century and the creation of the professional scientists. Into this new role stepped Lynch, whose life represents the role that science played in the study and management of nature. His life recounts efforts to understand the environment and intervene where necessary. A largely new phenomena in the 19th century A largely new phenomenon in the 19th century centered on the commerce of feather or the millinery trade. According to Robin Dowdy, the leading historical expert on the whooping crane, European influence and expansion of colonial markets affected wildlife across the world as early as the 1700s. The association of the elite with feathers stretched back to Roman times and continued through the Middle Ages. This association of class with the wearing of feathers created a craze for the ornamental plumages of rare birds. This trend remained among the privileged due to the high cost of the feathers. Its later association with the fallen queen Marie Antoinette during the French Revolution created a backlash against the wearing of feathers. And in many places, the fashion fell out, at least in the short term. However, due to the adoption of feathers as a respectable middle-class accoutrement by the mid 19th century, the increased efficiency of the millinery trade and the expansion of agriculture and settlement, bird life around the world plummeted. By the end of the 1800s, the first bird protection societies emerged, marking a major transformation in the, the Western mindset. The recognition that the environment and ecological sphere deserve, deserve protection as an actor in its own right. These protection societies marked an important turning point in the international context. Groups such as the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds in the United Kingdom and the Audubon Society in North America for, formed to conserve bird life and were eventually successful in their efforts. The groups created a campaign among high society members which then spread to the public over the 19th century. 
Their efforts inspired a similar campaign by the 20th century naturalist E.A. McElhaney to establish Bird Island in Louisiana. This preserve was an effort to restore the snowy egret population in the state. The bird was hunted to near extinction. Bird Island proved the savior for it and many species like it that were threatened due to a variety of forces interacting on their populations in the early 20th century. This corresponded with McElhenney's somewhat successful effort to establish wildlife refuges along the Mississippi Flyway to provide habitat for migrating birds as discussed by environmental historian Jason Terrio. As others such as Robert Wiebe have observed, this movement to regulate the environment and wildlife was just one in part of the much larger societal and cultural changes happening during the period. As Wiebe argued, the professionalization of all aspects of society included that of the sciences. The modern professional emerged as the new middle-class role in society. Professional positions such as that of expert flyway biologists replaced former avocational or ontological interests into this modern role, step John Lynch. Lynch grew up in Massachusetts and by all accounts, he lived a hard early life. His father died when Lynch was young and as the oldest, he worked to support his many brothers and sisters. According to lore, he signaled for bootleggers on the local Massachusetts coastal shores. Perhaps it was here that Lynch grew to love the wildlife that surrounded his nightly rendezvous. His later efforts at school earned him a recognition and set ablaze a lifelong love of learning and research within the young Lynch. He applied to Brown University in Rhode Island. However, due to lack of funds, he attended the smaller Rhode Island State College of Education. According to her accounting of his young life, he often cut class at the State College to attend a similar lecture at the more prestigious Brown University. Despite his frequent absences, Lynch maintained excellent grades. His devotion to learning was so fierce that he worked to deal with the local librarians to allow him to stay in the library after hours. He would often study with a flashlight until he fell asleep. This effort eventually earned him a degree in biology from Rhode Island State College around the turn of the decade. Over the 1930s, Lynch worked his way into the emerging bureaucratic management of wildlife. He operated a freelance wildlife research station in Newport, Rhode Island, where he banded birds and recorded population numbers. In 1935, a chance encounter with a biologist working for the BBS led to an offer of work in the National Wild Waterfowl Refuge located in South Dakota. The US Congress established the BBS in the late 19th century to take stock of the wild animal resources and populations, including feathered species. The passage of the Lacey and Migratory Waterfowl Acts earlier in the century created positions for biologists working in the, new, in the waterfowl refuges. Within a year, Lynch was offered a job based in Washington, D.C., grounded on his exemplary research. Here is where his official records of correspondence survive for the curious researcher. A letter from a former co-worker states, when the wind howled, the snow fell, and the roads were blocked everywhere else, we all wondered whether you were able to find the necessary roads open between Winona and Washington, D.C. The conditions in South Dakota were nothing to miss. In a letter of reply, Lynch comforted his old workmate. Take my word for it, spring is on the way. I can't predict how long it will take to get to South Dakota. That is, I could predict, but it would be rubbing it in. Lynch's new job consisted of visiting multiple potential sites for the establishment of federal refuges across the United States and reporting back to the central office. His reports detailed how national wildlife was drastically affected during the 20th century due to the environmental consequences of the New Deal. Reclamation projects started under the premise of mosquito control and the recovery of agricultural land led to lessening habitat for wildlife. Lynch also recorded out of control oil pollution and the effects that the widespread use of lead shot had on migratory waterfowl. When Lynch was offered a permanent position as flyway biologist in the Delta National Wildlife Refuge, he jumped at the opportunity. His first actual post in Louisiana was located in Pilot Town at the very end of the tip of the, extort, the extending land formed by the Mississippi Delta in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana, at the Gulf Coast Research Station of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Here Lynch observed the flora and fauna of the Delta with the specific instructions to learn whether grazing, burning, trapping, etc., should be employed on the federal refuges just acquired along the Gulf states. <laughs> 
He also provided a visual bird count of arriving flocks of migratory wildlife in the winters, which provided hard data for researchers across the country concerned with dwindling bird numbers. His roughly three year stint in Pilot Town provided experience with wildlife that made him invaluable to others as evidenced by the many letters asking for his advice or to speak on issues surrounding nature research. As part of his mission, he performed, he performed bird counts of vegetation surveys. It was during one of these flights that Lynch observed a bird that was associated with his research for the rest of his life. In 1937, during a flyover, Lynch located a small colony of whooping cranes in the White Lake area of southwestern Louisiana. As geographer Gay M. Gomez has pointed out, Lynch relied on not only the reports of naturalists such as McElhaney, but also the testimony of local trappers, marsh managers, and alligator hunters who related intimately with the marsh. The marsh dwellers' traditional ecological knowledge, or the knowledge of nature and natural processes gained by local people through long time frequent experience and keen observation, informed Lynch of the area most likely the haunt of the wild birds. A survey two years later confirmed Lynch's findings when 13 birds were noted during a flyover of the area. 11 adults and two young were identified. However, what seemed like an extraordinary find was most likely decimated in 1940 when a hurricane passed directly over the southwest portion of the state. Unfortunately, Lynch was neither able to confirm or deny the destruction of the population due to larger global events. By 1941, the United States entered World War II and Lynch was forced to abandon his observation of the colony for, an almost, a, for almost a decade. During the war, most wildlife funds were diverted to the confrontation. Lynch managed to stay employed with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service for two years until he enlisted in 1943. Here he taught survival courses for the, U for the United States Navy. The war continued to keep Lynch busy as he toured the South Pacific, collecting data on emergency survival. During this time, he was unable to track the wild population of whooping cranes in the state. When Lynch finally returned to active research in 1947, he worked on an alligator weed and water hyacinth control project along with obtaining his pilot license to fly bird surveys. Some of his research included work with fur biologists in the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, Ted O'Neill. When Lynch finally set out to find the lost colony of birds that he abandoned in 1939, he again interviewed locals familiar, familiar with the haunt of the whooping crane. This time, he created a documentary record of his interviews. Thanks to the efforts of Gomez, Nora Lynch, and Mary Lynch Corville, Lynch's daughters, these interviews are published for public use. The interviews addressed ecological behaviors such as migratory patterns, behavior, nesting, and feeding habits of the cranes. The information obtained during these interviews guided Lynch to a thick section of Panicum Marsh north of White Lake in Vermilion Parish. Here in a flyover in 1947, Lynch observed three adult whooping cranes, confirming that the population was still surviving, if just barely. The observed population decreased by one each year until in 1949, there was only one bird left in the White Lake colony. By 1950, the plight of the whooping crane was at a dangerous tipping point. With the wild population at a critically low estimate of around 15 individuals, drastic action was needed. This statistic included the one remaining wild bird in Louisiana and a population of around 14 migratory individuals that summered in the neighboring expanse of the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge along the coast in southeastern Texas. As Julian Howard, manager of the refuge expressed to Lynch, if the remaining Louisiana cranes combined with the Texas cranes, this would greatly expand the gene pool. The former pilot convinced his superiors that this was necessary for the survival of the crane and was subsequently issued a capture permit. On March 11th, Lynch along with Robert Bob P. Allen, research associate of the National Audubon Society, Nick Schneckscheider, director of the Rainy Wildlife Sanctuary in South Central Louisiana, and the pilots L.L. Mac McCombie and E.J. Smith meant to plan their escapade. After many dry runs, the, groups were, the group perfected their technique of jumping out of the helicopter and netting the bird. They practiced repeatedly until each phase of the operation was planned. After days of searching for the cranes, the group eventually cornered the last remaining bird near the marshes of White Lake. The words of Bob Allen describe it best. 
When the crane suddenly darted into an eight foot stand of dry sawgrass, Max stopped dead, hovered momentarily and set the helicopter down directly behind him. Nick was straining so hard on the safety belt that I had trouble releasing it. The door flew open and from the pontoon, Nick leapt to the grass with me behind him. Nets were unnecessary. In another second, Nick was holding the crane's bill and wings and I had his legs and feet. We had him. The group proceeded to gently tie the bird up and in a hurried all night procession, drive the distance to the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in Southeast Texas. Here the bird was released into a breeding pen where it was hoped it would breed with the native population. It is here where the story usually stops. However, a newspaper article written by Vern Hoffman of the Associated Press on April 15th reveals the true fate of Matt, the bird nickname for the pilot of the helicopter that captured him. The crane was attacked by the wild population and left badly bruised and bleeding while the migratory population headed north. The lonely bird was found dead six months later with the causes of death remaining unidentified. This incident factors into larger conversations surrounding the whooping crane. The effort to restore a whooping crane stretched back to the 1930s and the establishment of the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge under the executive order number 77841 by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The successive director observed a small population of birds. However, there was worry that any type of natural disaster would exterminate the entire population. Another great effort was made by the previously mentioned Bob Allen. Allen held a long time avocational interest in ornithology and started to work for the National Audubon Society in 1930. He quickly rose to the rank of field ornithologist due to his intense devotion to studying bird life. And in 1934, he was appointed head of the division interested in acquiring nature sanctuaries. Although Rosetta Spoonbills initially drew Allen to Aransas, the whooper caused him to return. After serving in World War II, Allen was fundamentally involved in many of the early efforts to preserve the whooping crane. He began a nationwide search of archives and museums for any evidence of historic whooping crane populations and nesting sites. Allen realized that to preserve the whooping crane, public opinion on the bird had to change. He instigated an effort to educate hunters on the endangered bird and connect various scientific interests who were independently interested in the conservation of the bird. One of the most important efforts that Allen, that Allen was involved with was the attempted captive breeding project. An injured whooping crane entitled Josephine was captured from the original wild non-migratory population in Louisiana in 1940 and was held captive at the Audubon Park Zoo in New Orleans. In the late 1940s, she was transported to the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge and placed in a small enclosure built for the birds. In May 1949, Crip, a wild bird from the Aransas population, successfully bred with Josephine, producing a chick in April of 1950. Unfortunately, the chick died four days later, most likely taken by predators in the enclosure. This was followed by more failures and deaths. In December of 1951, George Archibald, the director of the Audubon Park Zoo, demanded the return of his birds. The failure of the birds to produce offspring set off a debate that would plague cranes conservationists in the 1950s. The debate centered over whether to capture wild birds and attempt to hatch the crane's eggs in captivity or to protect the natural habitation zones. Those like Lynch who advocated for artificial assistance to propagate the whooping crane were prescient in their insight that birds population could only return with the help of man. While others like Allen favored a more removed approach and argued for the wild population to repopulate on its own. In 1954, the discovery of the summering grounds for the migratory population of Aransas birds in the little explored Wood Buffalo National Park in the Northwestern Territory of Canada created a stir among conservationists. The close observation that biologists made of the nesting ground revealed that although whoopers almost always laid two eggs, only one hatched most of the time. Later in the same year, Lynch delivered a paper at a conference advocating for the captive breeding of the whooping crane through the collection of the, of the extra egg. As seen through the correspondence of those concerned, this approach was widely favored. Soon taken eggs were shipped to Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in Maryland, where techniques for raising cranes were improved through experimentation with the much more numerous Sandhill crane eggs. Over the next several years, Lynch would instill his place as an advocate of the whooper. In 1955, Lynch moved his home from Abbeville to Lafayette, Louisiana, 
where he was a full-time instructor at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Here he taught seminars in marsh ecology and conducted bird banding operations. His home, located on the Brobridge Highway, served as a center of research and included a nursery and aviary. Two years later, Lynch and his wife, Mary Zoe Segura, were given a whooping crane from George Archibald, the director at the Audubon Zoo. The two placed the egg in the nest of another bird, a Japanese silky, a type of bantam hen, as a surrogate mother. The, fo the foster mother was selected due to the bird's noted perseverance, reportedly setting for up to six months for its eggs to hatch. The experiment worked, and the newly hatched chick was born to much fanfare and named Zoe in honor of Lynch's wife. However, the chick was killed in shipment to the US FWS research station in Colorado. During this period, Lynch was also fundamental in establishing surveys of migratory waterfowl, including sur surveying wild geese, swans, and branch, ne branch nesting sites in the Arctic. These efforts, along with his lifelong devotion to wildlife research, including the banding of thousands of birds, established his moniker as father of the flyway biologist. In the 1960s, Lynch and others formed the Whooping Crane Conservation Association to permanently help the species recover. The organization worked largely through the public education programs and efforts to influence wildlife legislation at the local, state, and national levels. During the ensuing years, researchers such as Archibald would discover that captive birds develop no boundaries to humans and natural predators. This weakness enabled predators to prey upon them with ease and would eventually lead Archibald to the invention of white crane suits for human breeders. Lynch's success with whooping cranes led to similar efforts with the captive breeding of Sandhill and Mississippi Sandhill cranes. However, in a letter recounting this period of bird raising, Lynch admitted that these activities moved beyond his expertise and advocate, advocated for aviculturalists to complete future work. In 1972, Lynch retired from the, from the USFWS and established the Orchid Gardens, an orchid nursery at his home. Lynch used this time to publish on the Yellow Lady Slipper, a native Louisiana orchid, and returned to semi-active duty to train researchers throughout the next decade until his death in 1983. However, what he remained most noted for was his effort of restoration related to the whooping crane. The whooping crane was effectively brought back from extinction thanks in part to the passage of the Endangered Species Act of 1973 and the subsequent efforts of conservation and restoration. The bird now boasts a population of a few hundred individuals. In 2008, 10 individual cranes were introduced to the marshes surrounding White Lake in Vermilion Parish, the original region where Lynch witnessed the last flocks in the 1940s. Despite massive amounts of publicity surrounding the bird's reintroduction, Louisiana remains number one in the nation for birds killed by hunters in North America. Campaigns to publicly shame crane killers by groups such as the Audubon Society highlight their continued conception of nature as both pristine and in need of active management. Hunters are not the only threat to the whooping crane. At the opposite end of the crane's migratory path, the development of the Canadian oil sands and mining operations near the Woods Buffalo National Park have prompted indigenous interests to invoke the creation of a provincial park farther to the south. A problem that the modern conservation boom has experienced is that by, outlining, by, by the outlining of protected borders such as the national park, this reflexively terms all lands outside the borders as open to development. As geographer Carl S. Zimmer pointed to, conservation boundaries establish only an ideal of pristine wilderness as a goal of preservation. Anything that does not fit a wide a definition of wide open majestic places is not deemed worthy of protection is thus open to development. Current events at Woods Buffalo reveal this attitude, which allowed industrialization to operate right up to the borders of the protected area. In turn, nature within the protected area can be affected, as is the case at the park where mining operations have affected water levels in the natural forming river deltas. This not only interferes with wading birds such as the whooping crane, but also the socially li social livelihood of traditional resource users, or as Zimmer terms them, nature society hybrids. In response, groups such as the First Nation Miskew Cree have led an effort to establish a buffer zone around the park. In this way, the members of this group have invoked their awareness as environmentally conscious subjects and citizens. Within the whooping crane story lies the origin of a lifelong struggle for conservation-minded Lynch. Lynch saw what others could not, 
The system was corrupted to the point of the inability to bounce back without the help of man. Despite his support of conservation models found at times in opposition to environmentalists such as Allen, Lynch also saw that man himself is slow to change. He's still the same critter. He has lots more to learn these days, and he's also learning a lot of things he's going to have to forget because they're not right. Perhaps Lynch was reflecting on his own efforts and saw that he too was an evolving creature, slow to change, with much left to learn. Despite the successful return of the bird population, conservation models often result in the regulation of public nature by professional agencies while alienating traditional ecological users, ironically the source that enabled Lynch to discover the haunt of the Louisiana cranes. The evolution of whooping crane conservation serves as a symbol of the larger elitism inherent in conservation and environmental principles that continue to separate the public stake and conservation efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, any questions uh, for Jacob? You can put them in the chat. And while you're thinking of that, um, I have a, a couple of questions for you. Um, and the first one is to kind of go back to the beginning um, and, and really ask, um, and this may be out of the purview of your study, but um, you were talking about the, um, uh, the use of feathers in millinery and how that really fueled the, um, uh, the issues with um, endangered species, endangered avian species. Um, and I was wondering if there, if, if you knew if whooping crane feathers were particularly valued um, during that time, or if there was something about this, the species specifically that made them particularly vulnerable to going extinct um, in face of this, because I'm assuming that I know that other species of birds were subjected to the same, um, but, but was there something specific about the whooping crane that made it more vulnerable to um, endangerment? Uh, I would say the, the, the particular characteristic of the whooping crane that made it evolve, uh, or vulnerable to um, vulnerable to extinction is mm -hmm. the fact that it liked to settle in the prairie. And so agricultural settlement is actually what led to the biggest decline in whooping crane populations because there simply weren't enough whooping cranes to, to supply the millinery trade, which is why you see more commonly, uh, commonly seen birds like egrets and, and herons employed in the millinery trade employed as, as the feathers used in the hats. I see. So they were more plentiful and therefore it, they were used more for the hats. Um, and it was just really where the habitat was for the uh, whooping crane that um, made it more vulnerable. So it really was, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, I'd never really thought about the New Deal in ecological terms before, uh, or at least not in this way in terms of uh, endangered species, but that's a really a valuable way, I think, of looking at these large infrastructure projects, um, that it's not a, you know, it's great for humanity, right? not so much for other uh, species. Um, which brings me to the, to the question, which is toward the end of what you were talking about, which is really where do, where do we go from here? I mean, you talked a little bit about needing to change people's attitudes toward um, conservation and not see it as separate from ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. But is there, I mean, how, how do we accomplish this? I think, I think um, William Cronin makes a really good point in that we have to see conservation as um, not a far off place or not, not these majestic pristine wildernesses, but you have to see it in your home and in, in every everyday environment. I think once people can start seeing that you have to make choices, especially consumer choices mm -hmm. that impact, you know, like larger environments, then you can make those consumer choices in your daily life that then contribute to, to conservation and preservation. Mm -hmm. That's great. I've got a question. I don't know if you can see this. It looks like it's maybe come to just me. Um, it's from Fernan Eaton. Uh, Jacob, thank you for a great paper. 
Uh, where is the research taking you? Or how wide a net are you casting? Do you discuss the damage federal tax policy has on environmentally damaging farm practices on the waterways within the flyways? No, that's a good, that's a great direction that I could take it. Um, no, my research is taking me actually, it's taking me back to the first part of my paper right now. So I'm focusing on McElhenney's film on the extinction of the, the snowy egret. But um, where would these federal, like what, what time period would these federal tax periods maybe, or federal tax policies? Fernan, uh, what time period? But that's it, it's a great idea that I should take note of. <laughs> Current, uh, he's saying current tax policies. Sorry about that. Um, I no, I hadn't actually, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's definitely, uh, that's definitely a, an interesting avenue that I could explore in the future. I know that that conservation policies are critically underfunded on a regular basis, so. I'm guessing that could be in that question or answer somewhere in there. I think you can see there's a question from uh, uh, Martin Guidry. Uh, can you see that one, Jacob? Yes. What? I think the other one was a direct. Uh, and and Fernand follows up. Um, it's the farm to fence post policy. Arm which is fence. also killing the monarch habitat. Farm to fence post policy. Is that where we pay farmers to, to grow like, so we're subsidizing, I guess, agriculture and then reducing, yes. I'm guessing reducing wilderness. Yes, he's saying yes. Okay. It's definitely an interesting avenue to explore that I have not explored. And then Martin, what future do you see for the introduced Louisiana flock of cranes? Um, I, I am hopeful that they will find a habitat that they can, they can definitely settle in. But I know that one of the biggest problems is that there isn't, there isn't a lot of habitat left. And I know that their traditional uh, living grounds were White Lake northwards into the prairie, which is near Ville Platte and, and that, that general area. And, Pretty much all of that area has now been converted to rice farms or or urban is urbanized so there's there's actual towns there so i don't know how much future the louisiana crane has but it's interesting because the louisiana crane we're also finding out that they don't migrate all the way back from you know all the way back to canada they're migrating to texas or they're migrating to alabama so I could see maybe a future in uh, a different sort, maybe not the same way that they used to used to follow the same migratory path. Okay. Well, John, I'd I'd love to talk love to talk to you more. And Palmetto Island is a great. I love the state park over there. It's a great. It's a great little exploration. Um, why do you think the crane was saved and not the ivory billed woodpecker too? Um, I think this has to do with the fact that the crane is the largest bird in North America. And so it's a very, it's a status symbol. You know, if we can save the largest bird, we're the best at conservation. So I think the whooping crane is a very easy sell to people. Whereas the ivory billed woodpecker may be a beautiful animal but it's a less maybe less uh, eye catching animal. So people maybe don't get it behind it. And then have you explored the position of commercial agriculture interests to the conservation of waterfowl and songbirds? Uh, no, I have not. Um, but I know that the, the White Lake Conservation Area, which was established for the whooping crane, was actually donated by Amico, which is an oil company. So I think there's, there's definitely, 
uh, industry element to, to conservation that, that's really interesting. And I've thought about exploring that more. Okay. Um, Fernan is asking a question of um, Abby. Um, could you say again what your next steps are with your project? Um, <clears throat> so my kind of, well, first of all, thank you for your question. Um, my next steps are, so this was a part of my master's thesis and I started it with um, the Louisiana Purchase and then I ended it with um, 1840 with um, the conclusion of the Texas War for Independence, but also a official um, kind of American led project to chart the Sabine River and establish those boundaries. Um, the next steps is I would, preferably I would like to look more at um, the indigenous um, perspective of these events because um, all of the people that I, uh, I talked about in my master's thesis um, spoke about um, different nations that were living in. And of course, that's also the time frame where we have the Trail of Tears and this kind of mass migration of people into Oklahoma and just moving westward. I know I would also like to, of course, uh, <laughs> look more at Acadiana. Originally, when I started doing my research, I was going to look at Dr. John Sibley and Natchitoches and then uh, William Darby in Opelousas. And I know um, probably like it was last month or the month before we had a presentation, a panel that had uh, papers about both of them, which I was like, oh, okay, I know those names. But I abandoned it because while Sibley uh, stayed in Natchitoches until his death in 1830, uh, Darby actually left Louisiana and he went back up to the Eastern Seaboard and I found that just kind of derailed my uh, narrative that I was going for. Thank you, Abby. Um, are there any more questions for either one of our panelists? You can put them in the chat. It takes a little bit longer, I guess, but... Um, if not, I want to thank you both for two marvelous papers. Oh, wait, we got quick um, from Beepole. Um, Abigail, do you know of any other reasons for the migrations of Creoles? Um, or Creole, the language? I think. She yeah, um, do you mean the people, the language? Uh, it's, it, it's a word with a lot of meanings. <laughs> <laughs> both. Okay, um, so I actually debated when I was putting this paper together, um, the opening little vignette that I read from Alsace Portier, I was debating about reading it in English or in Creole um, French, but I figured that would probably be a little bit isolating to our uh, non-Francophone uh, audience members. Now, as for like a migration of the language, I think that's really interesting because um, I've done a little bit of work with French in North America, and there was actually a, a relatively decent French population in Missouri of all places, now that they don't exist anymore due to you know the same things that are happening down here. Um, but I haven't really seen anything about like the French, like, like Creole French in Texas. Now, like Galveston, like, that area was actually a French town. And when I was doing research, um, people were worried like the French were establishing themselves in Galveston and they were gonna encroach on American, you know, settlements and, you know, take away farming land and, you know, general just like, oh, there's people over there that we don't know what they're doing. Um, and I'm assuming migrations of Creoles, I, I mean, it's all, it's mainly economic, I mean, you, you can go to Texas and you can get this land and there was all these like, like papers and, and like the newspaper and letters that were like, wow, if you go to Texas and you, you eat a piece of watermelon, you spit your seeds in the grass, like it'll grow watermelons like overnight. Whereas if you did that um, 
and the Sabina Strip, like a lot of like William Darby's works, they were like, you can't grow anything here. It's it's not worth living here because you'll just, you know, be forced to, you know, live pretty much day to day. And, you know, there's cannibals living in this area, which it was all just complete hogwash, but it was basically, basically more of like, kind of like a PR stunt where it was like, Texas is better than Louisiana. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, that's, so mine was actually, my paper's more of 1800s, so that's a bit of a time gap, but that's, that's an interesting route. I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. I'm going to make a note of that. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? I'm just waiting to give every, is someone time enough to get into the chat, but I think that maybe that this is it. And I just want to thank everyone for coming. And oh, wait, oh, excellent papers, excellent work. Um, thank you both so much for your presentations. Thank, thank everyone in the audience for coming and joining us this afternoon. Um, and uh, be sure to check out the other LHA offerings uh, that we're doing as uh, virtual um, meetings this time. And um, everybody have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much.